Good afternoon, ladies. If you have your seat, we will get started. Well, I'm Bill Jones. I'm the executive director of the Christian Care Center, and I want to welcome you to the seventh annual Hearts of Hope Women's Benefit Luncheon. Now, many of you might know, thank you. Many of you probably know a lot about the Christian Care Center, but for some of you, this will be your first time at hearing about the amazing stories that the eight different outreaches of the Christian Care Center do to impact our community as we meet needs and share Christ together. The Lord continues to provide wonderful partners who join us in this work, prayer partners who pray for the families that come on our campus. We have over 250 weekly volunteers that are the hands and feet of Jesus. They touch the lives of those that come our way. And financial partners who's had their hearts moved by the Lord to join us in reaching out to men, women, boys, and girls when no one else will stand by their side. Although we do have eight ministries at the Christian Care Center, today our Hearts of Hope event is really focused on our Women's Care Center. So today you're here, you'll hear several amazing stories of women who have had their lives touched by the love and grace of Jesus, and not only their lives, but their lives of their families as well. I want to thank you for being a woman who can, who will come alongside ladies who just think they can't in this season of their life. Again, thank you for being here this afternoon, and let's pray and get ready to enjoy our lunch together. Father, we are so grateful that we can gather together and celebrate the amazing, miraculous work that you have done in the lives of these women here today. We know that it's you who does this work, but it's those here in this room that you use as your hands and feet to take the love, the kindness, the generosity, and the grace that you have shown them and give them the opportunity to show the same things to the ladies you put in their path. I pray that you would, be, uh, you would bless these women here today and their families. Would you move in their hearts in such a way to use them as your servants, both for their good and your glory. Thank you for this food we're about to enjoy in this special time together. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ladies, I hope you'll enjoy your lunch.
afternoon, ladies. Welcome. Hello, everybody. <laughs> we are so delighted that you are here. Thank you so much for coming today to support the Women's Care Center. My name is Sherry Stewart, and I am so blessed to be the director of the Women's Care Center. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the Women's Care Center ladies. So if you are a resident of the Women's Care Center or a past resident, would you please stand? It's so awesome to see these ladies, and I just, um, so many memories are flooding through me now. Some, some of the past graduates, graduates and the ones that are in the program right now. We just love these ladies and are so proud of them. The Women's Care Center is a six-month faith-based in-house drug and alcohol rehab. We help ladies who are struggling with addiction. The ladies have to be at least 18 years old, and yes, we do have grandmas. <laughs> And they help our younger ladies, so it's a blessing, really, to have the grandmas and the young ones. We love them all. Um, they come from all walks of life and all over the country. And I just want to give you just um, a couple little examples of how, um, how easily that addiction can start. We had a lady that um, was a school teacher, and at night when she would grade her papers, she would have a glass of wine. And then the glass of wine turned into a bottle of wine. And then eventually the addiction just took over her and she was no longer able to teach. And then we had another lady that um, worked in a medical office and she had a surgery so she was prescribed pain medication. And then she started abusing the pain medication and so they had to let her go at the office. She came through our program, she did well, she graduated the program, and the same doctor that let her go at that medical office rehired her, gave her a second chance. It cost about a thousand a month to house one of our ladies, and we don't turn the ladies away if they can't pay, because um, many times their families can't pay for their sponsorship because they are taking care of the children while they are in, um, in our program. And many times the bridges have been burnt um, with the family because of the addiction. And the ladies are working on their recovery so we don't house their children with us at that time because um, you know, parenting and working on their recovery would be a very difficult thing. So the ladies aren't working jobs while they're in the program as they are in classes all day long and some evening classings. Working on their recovery is a full-time job. So some of the classes that they have are like Bible studies, life skill classes, parenting, anger management, relapse prevention, finance, uh, relationships. So it's a wide variety and we're just trying to give them tools in their toolbox to help them in their future. And also I wanted to mention another very important one and that's the life coaching class that they have too. Our program is highly structured and we are thankful for our many, many volunteers. Miss Gina and I couldn't do it without our, our volunteers. And I see so many of our faithful volunteers here today. And I just wanna say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. These volunteers come in and pour into our ladies. You know, it's not just teaching a class. They love on our ladies. They don't judge our ladies. They meet our ladies right where they're at. And it's such a blessing. They have a, a connection with them. And uh, it's, a re it's a relationship that they're building. And I was talking to one of our volunteers as she came in this afternoon. And she was crying and I'm like, you're crying already and the program hasn't started. You haven't even heard the testimonies. And she's like, I'm crying because she started, she started mentioning all the ladies. And she's like, I remember when they first came in, you know, what it was like. And you know, um, I wish you ladies could see, our volunteers are blessed to see this. And Gina and I are blessed to see this too. From the, the first day that they come in and then to when they graduate, the transformation that God makes in their life, it's just, it's a miracle. It's just a miracle and, and it's so, 
such a blessing to be able to see that. So the ladies, um, they meet with their addiction counselor weekly, and before graduating, then they start meeting with their life coach, and then she helps them into transition into the next phase of their life. And that is, um, they live with us for a while in transition, and they start saving their money, and then at that time they get a job, and then, then they're gonna take all those tools that they learned in all those classes and move forward into a life that God has for them. But you know, um, our program is a wonderful program, and if the ladies work the program, the program will work for them. But what we're really looking for is a heart change, a personal relationship with Jesus. That's what is going to sustain them. That's what sustains me every day, and that's what's going to help them in their future. And today, we have, it's amazing, okay, we have two Carolina ladies and so they're gonna to speak today, and the first lady is Jen, and she comes um, from North Carolina. She still lives at the Women's Care Center. She chose to make um, Leesburg her home because our church, First Baptist Church Leesburg, loves on our ladies, the ladies there. And so they, many times they don't wanna go back to where they're from. They wanna make this their home. So that's what Jen has chose to do. And then Tanya, she comes from South Carolina. Now she went back to South Carolina and she's doing ministry there. So um, there's tissues on your table because I think you're gonna need them. You, this, is, this is the best part of the program. It was wonderful to fellowship around the table with all you ladies and thank you again for coming, but you're in for a real treat. God bless you and thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Hey guys, nice to see you all. Thank you. My name is Jen Gentry. I am from North Carolina. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here and I just love looking out and seeing all you lovely ladies and thank you for spending the time with us today so that we can share with you all the wonderful things that the Women's Care Center does for all of us ladies. Um, I was raised in North Carolina. I was brought up the third child of upper middle class family. My mom was a stay at home mother and my father was a corporate climber. So um, to look at us, to see our family, we would be the quintessential American family, right? We had the big house, we had the cars, we had you know, the clothes, the vacations, the kids were all involved in the sports. Um, but unfortunately, our family secret, we had a dark family secret, my father was a raging alcoholic. He was abusive both physically and mentally, and um, it's unfortunate because it was swept under the rug. It was something that we weren't allowed to talk about, we had to keep quiet about. Um, I can remember when my dad would come home from work and he'd pour that first drink, and me just being scared to death as a young child, thinking, oh gosh, I hope it's not me. But when it wasn't, it was just as heart-wrenching because that meant I had to see my mom or my sister or my brother, you know, go through that. Um, so because of that, I became a total introvert. I just said, you know, I, I just tried to escape into my room. I became a bookworm. I was just very introverted until high school came. <laughs> and then I realized, hey, you know, there's people out there that I can socialize with. There's clubs I can join. I think I'll do that. It kept me out of the house a little bit more. And so it became this social butterfly, which I absolutely loved. Um, until it became to the point where I remembered my first drink. I had met my boyfriend, we were dating, and I think I drank like a wine cooler or something with him. And he said the next day, gosh, Jen, you know, you're so much fun when you drink. I had the best time with you. And that clicked, right? That stuck with me. So moving forward, you know, that was a staple of my, my social life. Like every weekend on the high school through college, you know, drinking on the weekends, but it was, you know, a casual, social, fun thing, right? When I was 19, I met who I thought was going to be like my love of my life. We locked eyes, of course, at a party drinking, um, but we were just, bam, we were in love. And so we were together for many years. Um, eventually, we became engaged, fell in love, became engaged, had that big country club wedding, um, had my parents 
at this point, my dad had stopped drinking, so things were better between us and our relationship somewhat. Um, and we had gotten married. They gave us money for a down payment for our house. My husband landed this great mortgage job. He was a mortgage broker. With a new house comes a new baby. So we were blessed with a beautiful baby girl. Um, things were good from the outside. But honestly, guys, from the inside, I was so empty still. I had, didn't have God. I had been placed all these materialistic things in my life. And besides from my daughter, of course, I was filled with her love. But I just was so empty and didn't know why. And um, so then one day my mom came to me and she said, What, Jen, I keep seeing this lump on your throat. Like, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Like, have you had that checked out? And so I went to the doctor and had it checked out. Come to find out I had thyroid cancer. And for probably many of you ladies in the room, it's pretty prominent uh, th having thyroid issues. So you, some of you may be able to relate with that, what comes along with that. Um, when my thyroid was removed, I had to go through many different stages to try and get it straight. And so along with that came a lot of depression and sadness. And that just added to the marriage already starting to, to deteriorate. So unfortunately, after 15, I think it was about 15 years of being married and being together, Instead of us seeking wise counsel or going to a counselor or finding a church, we didn't. We were just prideful. It was our pride. So we were just going to split. We were going to go our ways and split custody, and that's the way it happened. So here I am thinking, you know, oh, well, this great marriage didn't work. I have, something's got to work out for me. I'm going to make something happen. I know what I'll do. I'm going to build a career. So pride took over again, and that's what I did. I built this amazing career, became a senior area manager for a chain of hair salons. Uh, we, I met a gentleman that had four salons. Um, I worked for him and developed 28 along the way. So we, I traveled all the time. And in that process, through all of these times, all these years, I was still drinking socially. It just hadn't taken over my life yet. Um, and didn't think I had a problem with it. Unfortunately, um, because I was able to, to work my own schedule, I noted, and I was so highly stressed, like there was a lot of stress that came along with the job, because with it was a lot of money, and with that money came another big house, and a great BMW, my dream car, and this wonderful car I bought for my daughter, and you know, oh, I thought I had the life, but again, looking from the outside in, maybe it looked great, but I was so empty inside. This drinking started to creep in through the week. You know, I'll have that extra glass of wine, it won't hurt, or I'll have that extra drink, and you know, just one more. That became three, that became four or five. That became more than just one or two nights a week. That became every night. It became a wedge between my daughter and I. I really wasn't socially drinking anymore. I really didn't even care about dating. I, didn't, I just was starting to completely isolate. From there, my daughter ended up going to college, so, you know, it was just me, and I was completely empty. I didn't have God in my life, but I was too prideful to reach out and get some help. I didn't think I even had a problem, and I spiraled. And soon after, I was drinking every day, and uh, still. And so I, could, I can literally remember, you guys, I was able to schedule my own schedule, so I would, for two weeks it was, that I didn't even go to work. I literally, nobody knew where I was because I was scheduling my own stuff. As long as I'd meet with the managers that worked for me and held them accountable for what was going on, and I was still very productive, I could do whatever I wanted to. So I would just schedule days to stay home and drink. That's how bad it got. So ultimately COVID hit, and that affected everybody. And unfortunately, um, I lost my job. I spiraled into a drinking so much, I got a DWI. I literally just lost everything. Um, I was drinking because everybody was quarantined at the time. Nobody really was, was visiting each other, right? So I was able to stay at home and drink more. And um, I basically would just drink till I couldn't drink anymore. I'd pass out, get up, go to get an Uber, get more alcohol, more vodka, come back and do it again. I can remember being so bad off that I literally, could, I was shaking. I could not stand on my own. I was crawling to the kitchen to get up, pull myself up on the sink to get water into my throat because I was so dehydrated so I could get vodka down my throat to get to the ABC store and get back in an Uber, obviously. Um, it was just that bad. So eventually one of my best friends came and she said, Jen, you're dying. Do you not see what's happening here? You're literally killing yourself. And so she found a place for me. It was called Pierce Ministries in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is about an hour and a half from where I lived. 
Um, from there, it was an amazing journey for me. It was a nine-month program where I actually invited the Lord into my heart. I realized and repented everything that was happening, what I had done, all of my sins. I was baptized. I found a church family. I found these amazing people that loved me. I met this great mentor. Her name is Miss Sue Pike. Um, just all these amazing things were happening to me. Um, and so I went through the nine-month program. I stayed there after I graduated. And unfortunately, my mom had pretty bad Alzheimer's. And through the time there in Greensboro, I was able to visit her, but only like once a month. And so I felt compelled, and she had developed cancer too. I felt compelled that I really needed to go and be with my mother. Um, that was my mom. So I moved back to Raleigh, and I was visiting with her every day. It was amazing because if any of you guys have ever had a loved one that's had Alzheimer's, it, is, it just steals that steals them and they're just basically you don't they don't know you you don't know who they are anymore but what you do is just kind of go with whatever it is you can get from them right so I'd come in some days and she would say oh you're that sweet lady that's coming to pick flowers with me or oh did you come to brush my hair and I just yes that's exactly what I came to do because if that's who she thought I was for that day then that's who I was going to be because that's my mom and I'm going to love her to the end right and so, um, yeah, I, I was doing great there. Um, but what I didn't take with me when I moved was uh, like-minded friends. I didn't meet like-minded friends. I thought doing a couple devotions during the day would get me by. I didn't plant myself into a church. I did not have a support team. And so, unfortunately, yes, my mom did pass away. And if any of you guys have ever lost, I'm sure a loved one in here, you know, I don't care what, how much people try to prepare you for, or you prepare yourself, you, you're never re prepared to lose a parent or a loved one. And I literally just spiraled. That was it. I just gave up. I just, um, I, I couldn't, couldn't handle it. And I wasn't prepared and I didn't have the support that I needed. And that was all my own fault. I let go of my relationship with God, everything. And so that happened for a couple, couple of months. And then one of my, my good friends that had brought me to Greensboro um, was talking to me. She's like, you're drinking again. And I said, yeah. I said, you know what? I need to reach back out to Miss Sue. And Miss Sue was a mentor that I mentioned earlier. I had met in Greensboro. And she actually had told me about this amazing place called the Christian Care, Women's Care Center. And her daughter, who had... Um, was struggling, had been through the program, and she was doing so amazing. Her name is Jess Pike, and you, some of you guys might know her. She works for Bill in our administration office. Woo -woo. Uh, um, so I reached out to Miss Sue, and Miss Sue said, Jen, call him. Call Miss Gina. Call Miss Sherry. They'll do a phone interview with you, which they graciously did. And they graciously invited me to Florida. And my friend flew me here, and they brought me to the Women's Christian Care Center. So, Women's Care Center. So, with that, I mean, I was blown away. It was amazing. Everybody there was so un just gracious to me. It was such an anointed home. And these women were, like, coming up to me and saying, gosh, we've been praying for you. We've been waiting for you to come. Like, we've heard your story. We're so excited to have you. We had all these, we have still all these great volunteers that just were coming in and praying over me and pouring into me. And I just... It was so amazing to me, and like I redeveloped my relationship with the Lord, and I, you know, I repented and just dug in with Him, and you know, just health coaches, life coaches, all of these amazing things that were happening for my life. It was changing. I was about five months into the program, and I was feeling great until I got a phone call from my brother, and he said, Jen, you need to come to North Carolina. Dad's dying. That's it. He's, you know, you need to come say goodbye. So with permission to Miss Gina, Miss Sherry, I got on a plane. Miss Sue was gracious enough to let me come and stay with her or Mr. Jim. I stayed with them. They took me back and forth to see my father. We had a lot of heart-to-heart -heart conversations that needed to take place. Um, a lot of healing took place. Um, and I left there feeling like I probably said goodbye to my father. You know, I probably felt like I did. And I kind of felt at peace with it. I don't know how much peace you can really have with that, but I kind of felt at peace with it. And so I went back to the Women's Christian Care, Women's Care Center, and I had flown, wasn't tempted by the alcohol or anything in the airport or anything like that. So I came back. After about a few more weeks, I, my dad was still in the hospital. He was still there, and he was still coherent, and I was starting to feel convicted and feeling bad, like, here he is. He's 
still with us. Like, what is his, in his mind, what is he thinking? So I asked, I said, I just got to go back. I got to see him one more time. This can't say be goodbye for me. I'm just not comfortable with it. So I did, and I flew back. And when I flew back, um, I was there for just a couple of days, and my dad passed away when I was there. And that was it. I just literally, again, I didn't, I could, didn't handle it. I saw my brother lose it. I saw my family losing it. It was like a chapter that was over for me. Both my parents were dead. My mom had just passed nine months ago. I still wasn't healed from her loss. And I just made the bad decision. And I relapsed. And I drank. And I drank. And I drank. And I drank so much for those weeks. Miss Gina, Miss Sherry, Jessica, Miss Sue, they were all trying to figure out what are you doing? What's going on here? I mean, I literally was placed in the hospital for beginning stages of congestion heart failure because I had drank so much. I was on a suicide mission. I just didn't care. And I can remember them letting me out of the hospital. And I literally left the hospital and I went and drank. And that's where my mind was. The enemy was all over me. I didn't go turn to the Lord at all. And um, Miss Sue got in touch with me on the phone in the hotel room and said, I'm coming to get you. God took her and used her as an instrument. She wasn't going to say no. She said, I'm getting in the car from Greensboro, and I'm coming to get you with one of my friends, Diane, from Greensboro. And she did. She got in the car, and she drove to that hotel. She said, you need to open that door when I come. And um, at the same time, I'm a member of First Baptist Leesburg, and I attend the downtown campus. And we have three campuses. This is one of them. Well, once a, every Wednesday, once a month, we have a prayer night. And this particular prayer night, Pastor Cliff, our senior pastor, had invited all the campuses to come and the pastors to come to the front and take prayer requests. And we could write down these prayer requests, and people could write down the prayer requests, and they would pray over them. And so one of the lovely ladies um, at our house, I won't mention names, Meryl, um, <laughs> She wrote a prayer request and brought it up to the front. And um, unbeknownst to me, of course, I was with Miss, Miss Sue was coming to get me out of this hotel room. Um, the Pastor Cliff got it and read it. And he said, we're going to pray over this. And when we're done praying, we're all going to say Jen's name. Three, We're going to say at the same time, I'm going to say one, two, three. And we're going to say her name. And we're going to pray over her. And we're going to pray her back. And he did. He said, one, two, three. And everybody said, Jen. And if you talk about the power of prayer, like, he, they prayed me back. Miss Sue was an instrument of God. I was the one that God left that 99 Ford to bring back. He chased me down. Yeah. I feel so blessed. Um, and in Psalm 139.5, they say, he's, David is praising the Lord because it says, you enclose in front of me and behind me and you lay your hands on me. And that's what he was doing. He was just laying his hands on me and bringing me back. And he did. He brought me back to the Miss Sue and Mr. Jim. Miss Sue doesn't even fly. She got on a plane and she uh, flew back with me and they brought me back to Women Christian Women Care Center. So the beauty of all this is, you know, here I am feeling so horrible. Like I've relapsed. These people are just going to probably be like, oh, Jen, you know, and not be as forgiving. No, they welcomed me with open arms. They said, let's get you healed. You got to dig deeper this time. You got to get healed from these losses in your life. You got to figure out why you were drinking. What, what was the pro pro this process? Every single volunteer poured into me, every single, the health coach, my life coach, my everything, everybody just poured into me. They didn't judge me. They hugged me and loved me. And because of that, I was able to really dig deep, get a lot of healing done. Um, I, I uh, graduated the program in August. And from there, I have, um, I'm still in the house. I'm in transition, but it's been six months. I'm a year sober of February. This first of February is a year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I got my license back. I bought a car. I had a job doing, do, have a job doing real estate. Um, I'm actually going to step out of that position and step into getting my real estate license. So I'm super excited about that. I start that on Tuesday. I um, signed up for this classes. And look, guys, now it's time like for me to give back because so much has been given to me. I just want to give back. And I just say I'm putting on my armor of God every day. And I had dealt with a situation recently that if I had not 
So I had my tools, I pulled out of my toolbox this time and I used them and I fought the enemy and I sought wise counsel and I dug into the Lord and I dove into my devotions. I dove into church and to prayer time and everything that could be offered to me, I took it and I utilized it. And that, what could have been a relapse for me ended up being a victory. And that is from the Lord straight up. So. I wanna say thank you to each and every one of you ladies for letting me share my testimony. And I'm super excited to um, talk to all you guys afterwards and just thank you for the, your time that you shared with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you.
y'all. Hey, I'm Tanya from South Carolina, and I am so happy to be here. Thank you. So I'm just going to pause for a second. Um, this story is mine, but it's of the redemption and the restoration that Jesus did in me. So the first thing I have to do is I have to pause and I have to ask him to fill my mouth with the words y'all need to hear. Okay, so I grew up in a house, um, upper middle class income also. Um, it, I had a white picket fence out in the front. And for all practical purposes, it looked like a normal home. But on the inside, what was happening was anything but. Um, there was emotional abuse. Uh, there was neglect. And there was abandonment. Um, I was raped at age 15. So in 1985, people didn't talk about sexual abuse. Uh, and it's something that you know, was kind of a taboo topic. Um, but the problem is, is that when, when something like that happens to you at age 15, it leaves you with a lot of confusion. And if you've already dealt with abuse and abandonment in the past, um, you don't have a way to cope with that. Those are, that's a, a heavy load and a heavy burden to continue to carry through your life. Um, never felt comfortable in my own skin from that point on. Even though I was popular, you know, from the outside, everything looked normal. On the inside, there was nothing that was normal. Um, I got married in 1994, um, had a, my first son in 1996, and in March of 1997, I was prescribed OxyContin. Um, OxyContin at that time, there was no internet, there were no patient leaflets at the pharmacy, you know, Walgreens and you know, CVS, they didn't tell you anything about those medications and the harmful side effects that can happen. And so what ended up happening is I became addicted to prescription pain medicine. Um, I didn't overtake it. I didn't abuse it. I took it exactly like my doctor prescribed it. But unfortunately, um, you know, it's, it's a deadly medication. It's killed and, and, and harmed a lot of people and had a dramatic effect on their life. Um, I couldn't grasp this addiction because at this time, you know, I was a football mom, um, you know, I, my son was young, um, I hadn't yet had my second child, um, but I was, you know, I'd sit in the, the football stands cheering my son on, and I knew that I'd run out of medication on the weekend, and I knew what the rest of that day was going to be like. And the people who sat beside me had no idea that I was struggling with that. Um, in 2002, I had my youngest son. Um, I have two beautiful boys. Um, they're 27 and 21 now. Um, I was a soccer mom. I had a nice house. I had a great paying job. I was the breadwinner of my family. Um, you know, from, from the outside, everything looked normal. We had a great house, great cars. You know, it looked like a great life. But what nobody realized is that I was suffering from addiction. Um, you know, my, my idea of addiction was always those people who went out and bought drugs on the street, those are addicts. You know, it's hard to come to grips with the fact that your doctor prescribes you something that it inadvertently completely changes the course of your life. Um, um, so then I suffered, um, I was married for 22 years. My marriage came to a screeching halt. Um, we, you know, were separated, took about three years for a divorce to go through, but I was never cut out to be a part-time mom. That was the hardest thing I ever dealt with. And any mom in here, you know what it's like, you know, when your children leave and, and go back to college. I was only having, I only had my kids every other week, and it was heartbreaking. I was doing anything I could to self-medicate, went to my doctor again, different doctor, and started talking to him about some of the, the, the effects and the, the issues that I felt like I was having. Um, which now, looking back, was depression and anxiety. Um, but he ended up putting me on Adderall. On Adderall, I could do absolutely anything. Um, what Adderall is like, it would be like methamphetamine. Um, it, it absolutely destroys your life because what happens is you get so high up here that then you have to drink or do something to kind of pull yourself back down. So then I became addicted to alcohol. Became an alcoholic. Um, I ended up um, surviving two suicide attempts. Um, I went through three treatment programs, lost familial relationships, 
friendships. You know, I was so scared of my friends, the people that were closest to me, finding out that I was an addict. And so I just kept them at arm's length. And before they had a chance to realize that I really wasn't the person they thought I was. You know, I just pushed them away. Um, I ended up getting into an abusive relationship. The worst point, um, I was living homeless in a storage unit. It happens. Even to football moms, it happens. Um, I was living in a storage unit. Um, uh, it was about the time that COVID happened. And I actually went to the hospital and thought I had COVID and ended up having strep pneumonia um, and was septic. Um, the medication that they put me on to clear up the strep and the pneumonia cleared those up, but didn't clear up the sepsis. So by the time I went back two weeks later to my doctor for a checkup, I looked like an Oompa Loompa. Um, I was in full-blown liver failure, saw two transplant doctors, was on the transplant list, and, but because um, uh, I, I had this amazing person in my life that was beating the stew out of me, um, he started shooting me up with crystal methamphetamine. The problem is, is when you're in liver failure, your liver filters out the, all of the ammonia in your body, and so you become very confused. It was a horrible situation. Um, I ended up getting away from him a day he had me at knife point, got away, finally called the police. Um, he was arrested. While he was in jail, my aunt put me in a hotel so he couldn't find where I was. Um, in that hotel, for about four days, I felt, you know, free for the first time in a long time. The only issue is four days later, I ended up having a stroke. Um, I woke up and had no feeling in my arm, and it wasn't just like no feeling in my arm. It was like something from Scooby-Doo. Like, you know, you imagine like a zombie. It was, I, I had no, I couldn't control anything in that arm whatsoever. Um, so I ended up getting rushed to the hospital. I was septic again. Um, was a in a medically induced coma for about two and a half weeks. Uh, and the day that I was released, I had been hospitalized like 17 times for the liver failure from like j the January right after I found out I was in liver failure to that May just before having my stroke. And the same hospitalist that treated me those 17 times was the hospitalist that was there to release me the day I that I was going home after my stroke. And he said, Miss Lux, he said, I don't know how to explain this to you. He said, but your body has eradicated liver failure. And I knew at that moment, my body hadn't done that. That was Jesus. That was God. And God had a different plan for my life. Because the number of times I, I survived an accidental overdose, two suicide attempts. I mean, y'all, I mean, if I could communicate or, or, or show y'all, you know, a movie from my heart showing you what I was like at this time, I was just broken and battered. So I did made the decision at that point that I was willing to do anything I could, absolutely anything I could, to completely change my life. So I started trying to get into a treatment center that's in Charlotte, North Carolina. It was a four-month program. Um, and they ended up turning me down because, at, a month later um, because I was diabetic. Um, they knew that from the get-go, but it took them about a month to, to tell me that, you know, I wasn't going to get there. But again, God had a different plan. So my sister happened to call me one day, and she said, you know, Tanya, I don't know if this is going to turn out to be anything. She said, but I saw a sign up for an addiction ministry out of Western North Carolina. And it's called First Contact Addiction Ministry. So I called. At this point, I had absolutely nothing to lose. So I call, and that was on a Friday. And by the following Tuesday, I was on the phone um, doing an interview with Ms. Sherry and Ms. Gita. Um, I had absolutely no money. I had lost absolutely everything I owned. Um, you know, my family. I had one aunt that was supportive, and my sister was encouraging on treatment. But, I mean... Like, there was no money to be had. And so I interviewed with them, and they were willing to give me a scholarship to come to this program. First Contact raised the money that they needed to be able to, fl to, be able to fly me here. Um, and that's where my life changed. Um, the day that I walked in the door with Miss Gina, um, I knew that God was in that place. You walk in the door of the Women's Care Center, and you know that it is a house of miracles. And so while I was there, you know, Ms. Sherry still tells the story about how I used to go in and, and sit down with Ms. Gina and Ms. Sherry and just tell them how grateful I was to be there, because I was. Just the fact that they were willing to take a chance on me when nobody else was willing to take a chance on me for anything, you know? Um, I went through the program, 
Every one of the volunteers that volunteers at this ministry poured into me, you know. And the problem is, is that when you have, have dealt with any types of abuse, you've dealt with, um, you know, loss of family. Um, my kids weren't talking to me at this point. You know, I really had nothing left. Um, I had been carrying such baggage around with me the, my whole life. And that is, I mean, when you're, listen, let me just show you. Okay. So imagine carrying this little bricks everywhere you go. That's what I did. And that is an awfully heavy load to carry every single place you go. You know, but I think it was rooted in the fact that, you know, you know, I felt like my mom didn't love me, my dad didn't love me. You know, I was just kind of abandoned. You know, and I feel like that's the, the first place we learn about love is from our parents. And when you don't learn, when you don't get that, you just, you feel like a lost soul. And, you know, it was from every one of these volunteers that poured into me and showed me how much Jesus Christ loved me. And that he died, not just for me, but for you. And he died just for you. And he died just for you. You know, that, uh, I mean, that, that's life changing. Because all of a sudden, at that moment, you realize that once you know who you are according to him, what anybody else thinks of you is absolutely of no concern to you whatsoever. You know, you. So let me tell you what life is like for me now. I graduated from the program, went back to South Carolina. My oldest son got married um, right after I graduated. Um, my first grandbaby's on the way. Um, due in May, which I'm so grateful for, the relationship that I have with my kids and with my family and friends, I mean, like, like sisters in Christ that will lift me up no matter what. They hold me accountable. They're not yes people. They're people that push me to be better than I ever was before. You know, the person that I am now, you know, I... I, can't, I am a good friend of people. I'm a good mom. I'm a good friend. Um, you know, I'm a good daughter of the king is what I am. You know? And I take every moment I can to talk about how important that is. Um, I actually volunteer. Um, well, I do caregiving for two people. I, uh, I care for um, a lady who has pancreatic cancer. And I care for a gentleman who had a stroke about 20 years ago. Um, and that affords me the luxury of being able to pay my, my bills. That's what it does. But it also affords me the luxury to be able to volunteer the rest of my time. I have been on, if you include this trip, because any time, I feel like any time you're going to, to preach about what Jesus did for you in your life, that's a mission trip. So this is my fourth mission trip. I'm going to count this one. So I've done two mission trips to Kentucky to deliver backpacks to kids. Who, um, who, whose family lost everything. That's the only Christmas gifts they get. And it is absolutely amazing. Talk about really realizing the reason for the season is, is when you see the difference that, pe that just total strangers who have packed these backpacks for these kids making these lives. I went to Alaska. Listen, nobody would have paid for me to go anywhere. I mean, they wouldn't even pay for me to come to Florida. You know, the people in my church believe in me so much. And I got a scholarship from the WMU to be able to go to Alaska last year. I went to Alaska last July. Um, was able to help set up the women's ministry um, in a church and, and show them that you can't just rest on your heels waiting for people to come in the doors of your church. That there are people like me who are homeless out on the street who need to be touched also. We did an outreach in, a, in Tent City. Tent City in, in um, Anchorage, Alaska is actually larger than, Skid, than Tent City in Los Angeles, California. But to be able to make a difference in that church and to see that they continue to go out there, if nothing else, just to pray for people that are homeless, that just need help. They just need somebody to believe in them also. Um, I'm involved in homeless ministries. The bridge, the bridge actually, Bill Jones went to speak at First Baptist Spartanburg one time, and it was before they opened the bridge, and it is a food market and a clothing warehouse similar to the Benevolent Center um, that is part of the Christian Care Center. Um, it's a food market for people who have food insecurities. We provide food for people. It's enough groceries to last them two weeks. 
Um, we have a clothing closet so that people can go in and buy clothes. Um, and th th you pay $3 for a grocery bag full of clothes, but then that money goes back to the food market to provide fresh fruits and vegetables. Because people who have food insecurities are not buying perishable items. They're not buying fresh fruits and vegetables because they go back. Um, and then discipling to other women. You know, that's the biggest thing is, 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 is now me sharing a piece of what I've got with other women for them to realize how, how important they are also to the king. Um, my entryway at my house, I have to pass by it to go out when I leave every day and then pass by, by it again when I come in. And I have this crown there. And listen, this crown, I do not walk around my house wearing this crown. That is not what this is about. I just want to make sure y'all know, I do not think I am a queen. Um, but I went to a women's conference, and they had these as the centerpiece. And I started looking, and I was just like, that is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Like, if I can imagine what a crown would look like, that I'd be able to, leave, to lay at Jesus' feet one day. This is what it looks like. And so I have this on my entryway table because I have to pass it every day. And when I look at this, it reminds me of what God expects me to do when I go out, right? He expects me to be his hands and feet. And I, I want to have crowns to put at his feet. And the only way that's going to happen is by giving back to the women in my community what this community and what the Women's Care Center gave me. This is where I, met, this is where I really found Jesus. It really is. It, you can either be a fan of Jesus or you can be a follower of Jesus. I used to be a fan like, yeah, Jesus, that's my man. But now, like I am, like I am an absolute Jesus freak. And I'm just going to tell y'all that. You know, all that to be said, you know, what Jesus and what Jesus does in the Women's Care Center is this. He allows every woman that comes through the program who suffers from feeling all of these ways and dealing with all of these issues to finally put that load down. Because that's a heavy burden to carry with you everywhere you go. You know, it's a heavy burden. Um, I'm going to close out with my favorite scripture. It's my life verse. Um, for all of my volunteer, uh, all of the volunteers, y'all, oh, oh, I got to tell y'all something. So um, I have these moments where Jesus answers prayers. And so all of my friends, I'm a very friend, um, always hear me saying, are you kidding me, Jesus? Like, I just, I get so excited that I, like, are you kidding me, Jesus? You're giving me this opportunity. Um, you know, in, in this verse, everybody knows that Peter's my favorite disciple. Um, and my favorite verse in the entire Bible, um, and it's the one that I found so much comfort in here, and it really sums up what the Women's Care Center does for every woman that comes in here, is this, 1 Peter 5.10. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Thank you, ladies. Wow, how amazing were those stories we just heard of Lives Transformed. Jen and Tanya, y'all did an amazing job. Thank you for sharing. But you know who else is amazing? You. As I look around this room, I see all of you amazing women that are here to support ladies like Jen and Tanya. Hi, my name is Stephanie Peebles. I'm the Director of Development for the Christian Care Center. I have the privilege of seeing lives transformed, and I am passionate about the work of our ministries. Lives that were once lost have now found new life. As you've heard today, addiction does not discriminate. The Women's Care Center welcomes any woman willing to do the hard work to rebuild their life after addiction. This room is filled with women who have dreams we have dreams for ourselves and our families. We are filled with possibilities for our future. We are women who can. 
But as you've seen today, there are women in our midst who are struggling in this season of their lives. They are unsure of what to expect as they arrive at the Women's Care Center. Just as Jen and Tanya showed you, they find love and grace and understanding in a recovery process that meets them right where they are. They are challenged to do hard work, to set and reach new goals. They are poured into by faithful volunteers and their days are filled with hours of classes and celebrate recovery and relapse prevention. As we just learned from Jen and Tanya, relapse is part of the recovery. In many cases, it's not a fail. They learn how to forgive themselves and others. They find new hope that they can be all that God created them to be. While at the Christian at the Women's Care Center, the ladies learn how to have fun without drugs and alcohol, and most importantly, they find the loving and forgiving arms of Jesus. Women in the program are asked to contribute a small amount of money to cover some of the $1,000 per month cost it takes to house them. But honestly, most women, like Tanya when she arrived, cannot pay anything. They come to the program with just the clothes on their back, a long list of severed relationships unwilling to help them financially. Because of generous partners, no lady that wants to put in the hard work is turned away. Do you know that there are recovery programs that cost upwards of $30,000 a month? They are outrageously expensive. The Christian Care Center's Women's Care Center is a faith-based six to 12 month residential program where ladies receive three meals a day, a safe place to be, personal care items, laundry facilities, counseling, education, job coaching, and Christ-like loving care, all for about $1,000 per month or $12,000 per year. The Christian Care Center does not receive any federal or state funding that would compromise the faith-based tenets of our programs or services the foundation which lives are transformed. We rely on financial support of compassionate individuals like you. Today, you have heard two incredible stories of transformed lives that are indeed more than inspiring and touching. You can help ladies like Jen and Tanya by giving a generous gift today. Our goal for this two-day event is to raise $90,000 for our Women's Care Center. Only God knows the resources that are sitting in this room today. My guess is many of you are blown away by the testimonies you just heard. And it is our hope that you will give a gift larger than you had planned on before coming and hearing how these lives were transformed. Whatever generous amount you decide to give, make it a big gift. And by big ladies, I mean add lots of zeros. You will leave today knowing that your generosity will go a long way to ensure that the Women's Care Center has the resources to meet needs and share Christ with every woman that comes our way. Today's stories are a great example of how it's not just one lady or one life, but many lives transformed because of the love and recovery that is found at our Women's Care Center. Jen is influencing other women on a daily basis to live a godly life. Tanya is in ministry in South Carolina and helping ladies that are where she was so many years ago. Think about how many ladies in future generations you are really helping with your gift today. In a moment, I will tell the table hostesses to pull out your pink envelopes. But for now, I need you to listen to these very important instructions. There is an envelope for each lady at your table. Ladies, you can insert cash into the envelope. If you do, please fill out the envelope so that we can thank you for your gift. You may insert a check. Make the check payable to Christian Care Center. Hearts of Hope or HOH can go in the memo. There's also a QR code on your envelope. You can scan that to pay by credit card or you can put your credit card information on the envelope. And 
If you want to pledge an amount to be taken from your required minimum distribution, you can also do that, and we can get that from you. Maybe you'd like to give more than you're actually able to give today. On that envelope, there is an option for a reoccurring charge. So you can check either weekly or monthly, and we will input that, and it'll automatically come out so you can give over the next year. We appreciate your continued support throughout the year. If you are a guest at your table today and you enjoyed being part of this Ladies' Benefit Luncheon, maybe next year you want to play a larger role and you want to be a table hostess and invite seven ladies that you know to come and hear how lives have been transformed. There's a box on your envelope. Check it. It says, I want to be a table hostess next year. And then we will contact you next year and you can play that part. Thank you guys so much for being here. If you want to pull out your pink envelopes and pass out those envelopes now, you can. And thank you for being a woman who can. If you could leave your pink envelopes on the tables, somebody's going to come by and collect them shortly. Thank you. Ladies, my name is Gina. I'm the assistant director and residential manager at the Women's Care Center. That's, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that's a really nice way of saying house mom. And I gotta tell you, that's a title that I love. I am really blessed to see all of the amazing things that happen at the Christian Care Center campus and especially at the Women's Care Center day in and day out. It's amazing. I would just advise you ladies, if you haven't had an opportunity to, to take a tour of the Christian Care Center, you probably want to set that up because it's really an amazing place. So at this time, would all of the table hostesses just raise your hand? We just want to say thank you so much, ladies. Thank you so much for inviting your friends to join us here today. We honestly could not have done this event without you. We really appreciate you. We also appreciate Brenda Roselle. Not only, <laughs> not only did she pick out an amazing song, she sang it so beautifully and we were truly blessed. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> Also, we'd like to thank the Village Park Campus of First Baptist Leesburg for this beautiful setting that they've hosted for us today. It is beautiful, and we appreciate it so very much. And ladies, there's a lot of small details that have to go into putting in an event like this together, and we have an amazing administrative staff that worked on just that. So we'd like to give a special thanks to Joy Callum, Stephanie Peoples, and our very own Jessica Pike. They did a great job. Also, a big shout out to the AV team for the music and the... Uh, the songs and the uh, slides and everything, they did a great job. We really appreciate it. And by this time, hopefully you've seen the bookmark and the pretty pink pen on your table. Those are a gift for you to take with you. And hopefully when you take that with you, each and every time you look at it, you'll be reminded of what you saw and heard here today. Hopefully that will prompt you to pray for the Christian Care Center, especially for the Women's Care Center. We do covet your prayers, and we hope that you will just look back on what you heard today and just pray for us. Thank you so much. Now, ladies, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking out your time to join us here today. We really appreciate you being here, and with that, we'll close in prayer. Before I close in prayer, <laughs> I also want to thank Jen and Tanya. Thank you so much, ladies. <laughs> 
ladies, I know it takes an awful lot to stand up here in these bright lights just like me and just forget everything. So I, I know it takes a lot to stand up here and just be so courageous and bold and just to pour out your hearts and be so transparent. And we appreciate you so much, more than you know. And we're just blown away by how good God is and how you are both allowing him to just use you in a mighty way. We love you. And now, ladies, before I forget anything else, we're going to close in prayer. <laughs> oh, Father God, we just praise you, Lord. We thank you so much for your amazing grace and for your mercy each and every day. We thank you that you, God, are a good God. You are faithful, you're good, and we are oh so thankful. We're blown away by your goodness, actually, so blown away. We thank you for how you transform lives, how you're not just a God that, that gives us first and second chances, you give us third and fourth chances also. We thankful, we're thankful that you, God, redeem our stories. God, I pray that as we walk away today and we are reminded by what we've seen and heard, I pray that all the glory would go back to you. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to use each of us, continue to shape us and mold us, Lord, and may we all continue to be a lighthouse for your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much, ladies. Have a great afternoon.